Okay. So welcome everyone. This is creating authentic experiences for your online course. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, we're going to start with some introductions and I'm going to start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Tracy Miller and I'm the online teaching coordinator uh, here in Faculty Development Instructional Design Center. Um, I'd like to share a little bit more about myself this time um, because uh, in the summer, we um, do things a little differently sometimes. It's often the time to um, kind of try new things, learn new things um, from us here in faculty development. But um, it also gives us a chance to maybe share a little bit more about our expertise um, in the field of education, educational technology. So some of the things I'd like to share with you today is that um, I really am an expert on um, authentic experiences and part of that comes from the fact that um, I have been an online student. Uh, I finished up my bachelor's degree um, uh, over 10 years ago now, um, typical online student at the time where I was just trying to finish up a degree um, and then really developed a passion for the online environment, and then went on to get my master's at the University of Illinois also as a fully online student. Um, I also have a professional background. Um, previous to coming to Northern Illinois, I worked at the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy, and um, it's called EMSA for short, so if I, if I say EMSA, that, that's what I'm referring to. Um, and it considers itself an educational laboratory for imagination and inquiry. I realize that sounds a little bit like Disney World, but um, let me just tell you that they're very serious about um, trying different educational models, uh, different strategies, um, and it really is based off of anything that the students can imagine um, can, can it happen and really inquiry based. Uh, inquiry based is very important to uh, authentic learning experiences and so that's why I'm going to try to tie some of my um, inquiry based experience into these um, creations of authentic learning experiences. Uh, I also wrote a book chapter on the subject and so I've really thought a lot about how to share um, some of these educational strategies uh, with uh, faculty members here at NIU. But I want to know a little bit more about you. So um, usually I ask for names and departments and things like that. Today it's going to be a little different. I want you to get outside a little bit. I want you to get out from behind your screen. Um, so I want to know where you are geographically. and an estimate of what you think the temperature is outside and I think you can probably observe whether it's raining or not and go ahead and share your answers in the text chat area I can tell you that I am on campus in DeKalb in my office um, it's about 80 mid 80s I'd say 85 and it is not raining here. Peter it's not raining for him either. Kevin is in Oswego and it's sunny and 86 degrees. I used to live in Oswego. Uh, Bill is at the School of Music. No problem being a little late I know how you know how to use the interface. No rain for anybody. Oh, Jennifer's um, at Wabonzi Community College. Not raining and very hot. Um, I'm semi happy with that, Jennifer, because now I do live in Sugar Grove, right near the community college. And um, I know that we've been getting a lot of uh, these interesting rainstorms, but I think my plants could use a little water today. And Joyce, welcome from St. Charles. So basically what I have just had you do is you, take, you took a little mini field trip there. Um, this was something that um, you, know, you could do with your students. Uh, online learning can have this reputation for it being very isolating. And um, sort of this image of everybody's just behind this 
um, computer and you know there's no way that they can experience the real world and uh, that's just not the case so um, I've learned a lot from you in just the last few minutes that it seems like uh, we don't have any rain in the area um, everybody um, is coming from um, seems like we're all here in northern Illinois right now so um, I can be pretty assured that um, we're experiencing a warm, dry day currently. Um, so I want to share a little bit more about um, some of the authentic experiences that I had as an online student. And this was really over 10 years ago that um, this experience that I'm going to describe happened. And I was a student, an environmental studies student, so a lot of environmental science, a lot of um, um, culture and geography uh, mixed into my program. Um, I went to a very competency-based um, institution called Union University and Institute. And what they did is they um, chunked everything into semester-long studies. And you were to develop your own study. And um, as long as you address certain competencies, um, and you had that backing and that support from the faculty, um, you would get the credits required. So for this particular semester that I'm going to describe, um, I really needed some competencies in art, history, religion, and science. And so what I did was I constructed this um, project that I called Culture and Viniculture, an interdisciplinary study of grapes and wine in history, in art, history, religion, and environmental conservation. So yes, I did an entire semester on them. So how is this an authentic adventure, as I've described it here? Well, first of all, I got to drink plenty of wine. Um, I, I went to wineries. I did wine tastings. Um, I talked to the vintners. Um, it, a lot of the art. Um, I did. I, I took photographs. I um, tried different mediums, watercolors, pencils. Um, you know, I just wrapped all experience, the experiences that I had um, into my study. And it was definitely something that wasn't sitting behind the computer. You know, again, I was out in, um, in vineyards and um, even like farmers markets and other places where um, environmental conservation is, is so important to them. But I really focused my study around a region in France because I heard they had sustainable um, practices in growing their grapes and creating their wine. And I was sort of exploring this, and this region, and it's the uh, Rhone region in France. And it's southeast side of France. Um, and all these years, I always wanted to actually go and um, see what I had learned so much about. I had seen the Illinois vineyards, but I wanted to see those ones that I was studying in France. And so just last June, I went to Avignon, and the picture you see here is uh, the Papal Palace in Avignon. And one of the reasons that this wine region was so important and how I actually was able to tie in the religious component is because there was a string of French popes um, hundreds of years ago, and uh, they had to have their French wine. And so they developed uh, the vineyards and their French wine and uh, built this beautiful palace. Um, in France. So this is how impactful uh, this experience was to me that, uh, you know, 10 years later, uh, the, the place I chose uh, to go to was this region in France. Uh, and that's one of the very important factors um, with authentic experiences is they really stick with you. And I think that's what we hope for our students is that, you know, we're going to have a lasting impact. Um, it's not something that uh, they're just going to forget about after they take the final exam. Um, so, you know, that's what I can share with you um, and how important that these experiences can be for your students. So how important is this workshop for you? 
Um, what I'm hoping you walk away um, being able to do is identify what an authentic experience is, um, begin to plan your authentic experience, and then how to prepare your students for an authentic experience. Uh, I asked kind of um, an early pre-workshop poll how many had uh, already taught online. And it seemed like that most, at least the early folks, um, were, this was something that they hadn't done yet. Um, so this will maybe inspire you. But uh, if you've been to my workshops before, you know that at some point, I just stopped talking almost about how important it is to online. And it really just becomes something that you can do in an online environment or a face-to-face -face environment. It, it really starts to work um, for both types of audiences. For what is an authentic experience? Well, uh, first of all, uh, here's the Wikipedia definition. I think it works, so I wasn't going to climb all over other definitions. Um, but it's really an instructional approach that not only allows students to explore and um, make meaningful connections between maybe the concepts that they're learning in the course or that you're presenting to them, but then they can um, see them in this real world context. And that's when it sort of becomes more real and more relevant to them. Um, so I do like this definition. I think it, it works. Um, but what does all that mean? So then I did do a little bit more digging. And I um, found this four characteristics of authentic learning. Um, this is the, uh, the source that I used. Um, the four characteristics they talked about was real world problems. So if you're in an authentic um, learning experience, it's going to be real world. Um, it's going to be about inquiry and critical thinking skills. Uh, there's going to be some kind of discourse. Either um, there's going to be that social learning aspect where the students are going to be discussing their learning together, or it's going to be community-based, because a lot of um, authentic learning experiences um, are you know, definitely sending our students out into the community. And then it's considered student-directed. Um, and we will talk a little bit more about student-directed very soon. Um, but I created this Wordle. And if you saw this before, I kind of just threw a bunch of the words that I was finding in these characteristics and these um, elements of authentic learning. And the more often a word shows up, the bigger it becomes in these wordles. And I've got to be honest with you, when I was putting this together, um, I was all on, oh, great, learning comes up first, because that's what it's all about, right? And if you're not seeing um, a lot of intentional thing taking place, um, something's missing. Community. Community is so important um, in, again, that authentic environment, that community of the real world. Uh, but defined up top, at first, oh, maybe I should take to find out, you know, why did it end up so big? Um, but when I went back and looked at it, and I went, of course it has to be really big and important. And it did show up in a lot of the literature because um, we can be, we can have a good idea about what we want an authentic experience to be like. Um, but if we don't really define it very well for our students, um, there's going to be confusion. We think we have it all planned out in our mind. And that's when they're going to um, pick about part something that hasn't been defined yet. So that's what I'm really going to try to show you today, is how we can really um, button up and define um, what we want our authentic experiences to be. Um, so when you're planning an authentic experience, you, of course, always want to start with your learning objectives. Um, we don't want to get tied into, well, somebody told me I was supposed to have an authentic learning experience, or all the other um, professors in my department um, do field trips, so now I've got to do field trips. Um, make sure that it's something that's going to connect and match up with your learning objectives. I pulled together a bunch here. Um, hopefully, uh, one or two kind of click for you. Um, 
students will be able to execute a professional sales call, appraise an aesthetic value of an artifact, identify the components of a nursing facility. Um, I know we've got a, a nursing um, faculty member here today. Um, describe the role of an electoral judge, critique a temporal quality of a performance, um, utilize geographic tools. Um, just in case um, you were wondering, I did look at what departments you were from and tried to at least place a couple in there that um, you might resonate with. So we've got a bunch of learning objectives. The first one that I'm going to kind of use as my example is that students will be able to appraise the aesthetic value of an artifact. So you have your learning objective in front of you. You're trying to, you think, OK, this is going to be one that's really going to be awesome with an authentic experience. But you want it to be really clearly defined. You want to make sure you know what the students need to do and what you need to do. So um, I've kind of created this table and some of these questions that you should be asking yourself. So the first one, who picks the audience or the location? Um, sometimes it seems like really obvious. Well, it's my, you know, I'm designing this experience. I should pick what the audience is and the location. Sometimes you can't do that with your online students, especially a location, because they can come from all over the world. And you can't necessarily have um, planned out a location um, in all of these different places. And so it may be up to the student to plan the location that they are going to have their authentic experience. Uh, again, I was using as my example um, a uh, appraising an artifact. And so I kind of just threw this artifact. Um, you can make suggestions. You don't have to pick the actual location. But maybe you're going to tell them you know, they should visit a local museum, or they should look for a local research project that's going on. You know, you can give them suggestions and then maybe even have them defend their choice on why they picked a particular location. Um, what will the, stu the students need to know? Uh, what is going to be that prerequisite knowledge that they need to know? Or um, what are they going to at least need to know um, midway through maybe an experience? And, and maybe you're um, giving them some of that content um, in other ways in the course. And it's just kind of coming all together with this authentic experience. Um, what will students need to do? And, and this can be you know, as easy with our example here of go to a museum. Um, but it also should be, um, should they take notes while they're there? Should they take pictures? Should they interview uh, the curator? You know, what are the, some of the things that the students need to do? And again, from the perspective of, is that something that students need to define in a proposal? Or is that something that you will be providing to them um, to make sure they meet all of your requirements? Um, what is the tangible product? Um, are you going to select that product? Is it, it, is it a presentation? Is it a paper? Or are you going to allow them to choose kind of their own adventure and create their own product? Um, and then what tools will they need? Um, and that can be anything from do they need um, a camera to take the pictures of the artifacts? Uh, do they need a recording device to um, interview that curator? You know, and again, do they get to pick the tools or um, are you going to be requiring the tools? So first two steps of creating an authentic experience. Start with your learning objectives and then start asking yourself some of these questions. So the next thing uh, is you know, how to prepare your students. Uh, one of the things that was kind of those the word that popped up as one of the four characteristics and popped up on our word cloud was um, that students in these experiences are often more self-directed or student-directed. And so students aren't always prepared for that. So what are some of the things that we can do to help them prepare for that? One is to write up really good instructions. 
Um, and I'm going to kind of go over these points, but then I'm going to give you that online advantage um, that I think that online or even putting some of the things online is just so important to these authentic experiences. You're writing up really good instructions. The online advantage is you here at NIU can use Blackboard, and students will have 24-7 uh, just-in-time access to those instructions. So they can go back and find them really from anywhere that they are to. So if they're at that museum already and um, they're like, oh, how many pages of notes did she say I needed to write? You know, they can pull up those instructions. Uh, you could also use multimedia. So if you'd like to provide your students with instructions, maybe using a video. Um, very easy to do. Um, maybe you want to take them um, into your world and maybe give them an example of um, what they should be doing. Maybe you're walking through that museum. Um, provide them with exemplars. Uh, the advantage of being online for exemplars is you can actually um, link things to outside resources. Maybe there's um, an example of something that you think would um, show them exactly sort of what you're looking for. You can also um, ask students if you can show off their their artifacts or their presentations or you know whatever um, kind of is that final product um, semester after semester. And so that's a real advantage of having things online. Um, you can share your professional experiences um, with them, and that will help prepare them for this real-world experience that they are um, now doing. And so, uh, again, whether it's taking them through a, um, a museum themselves, whether that you're actually doing some lab work, or even interviewing someone if you want to give them some um, examples of how a really good interview should be run, then give them your professional experience. The online advantage is that, again, you can use videos. You can point them to your professional blog. There's so many things that you can do um, that kind of um, puts whatever you're trying to share with them in the best light, I think. And then set your expectations um, using rubrics. So um, that's where it can get really gray in some of these areas. If you construct a really good um, rubric, it's going to help you grade, which is why the Blackboard Interactive Rubrics is a great advantage. Um, but it's also going to set those expectations for your students. Jennifer, thank you for coming back. Um, hopefully that connection stays um, firm for you. Um, good. So the last thing on this screen actually says stay tuned for some exemplars, because I always like to um, model the behavior that um, I'm trying to give to you. So I will have some actual exemplars of what I think will be some great authentic learning experiences. Um, so whew, i got to catch my breath. Let me know if anybody has any questions, too, by the way. I'm going, I have a lot to cover, so I'm trying to go through this quickly. Any questions or even any um, input on something that maybe you've done to prepare your students for uh, maybe a new activity that you've planned? Oh, what makes the rubric interactive? I was like, that makes the rubric interactive? I knew it wasn't hat, Peter. <laughs> um, what makes the um, Blackboard rubric interactive is you pop it open when you're grading things. And it's just kind of um, you click on different boxes, and it adds up the score for you automatically. So um, it's a little different than having sort of a paper copy um, in front of you, and you're kind of adding, you know, adding up the score on your desk on the side. It, it just you can um, again click on those boxes. You can say whether they met the expectation or the expectation uh, needed work. You can provide your students with um, feedback directly in that area. Um, 
that you're kind of pinpointing, let's say, um, it wasn't uh, written in the proper um, style, citation style, that your discipline calls for you. So you can add feedback right into that particular part of the rubric um, it, without any space constraints either. So you, you know, you're, not, you're not having to write them in between the lines on sort of that paper copy of a rubric. Try them out. They're definitely, there's so many good reasons for rubrics. Um, so what is an inquiry-based experience? Um, you're welcome, Peter. Um, an inquiry-based experience um, actually has a range. And I, when I used to work at EMSA, uh, we talked about this spectrum. And I kind of added this visual diagram at the top. An inquiry-based experience can be anywhere from directed, which is giving you a lot of um, definition, a lot of direction, very instructional, all the way to a very open inquiry experience. That would be where the students um, were really um, creating their own questions. What did they want to know more about? Similar to what I did when I had my semester on wine, where I really constructed um, everything that I wanted to learn about um, and kind of guided myself through my own learning. Now, I was an adult at the time. Um, I know all of our students are adults, right? But I was really an adult. Um, so they always say, um, you know, a more experienced person um, has an easier time with the sort of open-ended type of inquiry. Um, it's also much harder to teach. We, um, we have to think about things differently. Uh, definitely, it's more on that um, guide on the side kind of mentality. Um, we have to be comfortable with maybe not knowing all the answers. Um, but we, um, it's definitely possible, um, and students definitely need our support through it. So I've created a parallel line here because I think as you do sort of move up this inquiry spectrum, you start becoming less of this faculty-centered approach and moving into the student-centered type of learning environment. And what we need to do for our inquiry-based experiences and our authentic experiences is that um, we start with where we're comfortable. And we try something a little bit different, try some of these approaches. Um, and we kind of, as our confidence and our um, comfort level increases and our students are getting more comfortable with these experiences, we're going to kind of keep moving up um, into these other avenues. And again, based off of our um, learning objectives, because not all learning objectives needs um, such a um, messy problem type of approach as an open inquiry would, uh, would have. So the example I have here is actually a pretty simple one. I, I wouldn't say it was even too high up the, the inquiry spectrum here. Um, but we want students to be able to identify the proper equipment, and I define that as technology. Uh, needed to conduct a water sampling at a local pond. And the local pond is the context. So even if we want them to know how to um, identify and use and sample water, um, we don't necessarily, they're not all going to be at the same pond. Uh, these online field trips um, are not at all very often in the same place. And so we're just saying that we do want it to be in a local pond. So we're not saying an ocean. We're not saying a lake. Uh, we're definitely looking for kind of a, a sampling done in a um, We talked about who does what in those rules. So for identifying proper equipment, are we going to provide them with some kind of resource that will tell them what proper equipment they need? Or are we going to have them sort of investigate what the proper equipment would be um, to conduct water sampling? Again, your choice. You just need to define um, how the experience is going to be run. Um, so after they've identified the proper equipment, um, the activity is going to be using that equipment um, and doing their sampling. And so that's a um, shortcome outcome 
a short-term outcome, and then they're going to do an analysis after the fact, which is going to be a little bit further down the road, uh, maybe combined with um, samplings from several ponds, something like that. Um, so the activity is actually an assessment because they're going to have to share their results with it. If they did not identify the proper equipment at the beginning, they're going to figure that out very quickly um, when they're actually doing this sampling procedures. And so that, again, is the value of this authentic experience. Uh, we can tell them about it in our lectures and our presentations. They can read about it in an article or um, our textbook. But when they actually have to go out there and do some water sampling, that is when that experience is going to stick with them. They're going to learn from their mistakes. Um, I can guarantee next time they go out to do a sampling, they're, they're going to have the proper equipment with them. So any questions on um, this idea of uh, moving from a very directive, prescriptive um, inquiry um, kind of up the spectrum, or how you can kind of plan out this, these activities a little bit? And really, I'll take any questions. OK, so the way authentic experiences often work is there's definitely um, an online component um, interwoven in. Um, maybe you're introducing the project. You're um, backfilling it with some other kind of content. They're going out into the world. They're going on their field trips. They're doing their lab experiments. Um, they're um, watching a wonderful performance. Um, but then they're going to come back, and they're going to need to share that experience uh, in some way. And then it's also going to be need, need to be measured against that learning objective. So here are some ways that um, students can share their experiences in an online environment or even a face-to-face -face environment. Um, in online, you're going to have that, um, whatever that is, it's going to be sort of captured, which is nice. Um, if they reflect verbally in your face-to-face -face, uh, course, you would need to um, really record it in order for them to kind of keep it. Um, so it's always kind of nice in the online environment. It's kind of one of those advantages. But um, any kind of artifact. Um, a, a reflection is always good. What did they learn through this exper experience? And sometimes it's what's back them to learn. And other times it's something completely different um, that they've learned. Um, are you going to have them share it through um, straight up written work? We talked about this sort of term papers, um, just synthesizing information that they gathered. Is it going to be a creative work? Uh, when I did my um, semester of wine, and I had to create a lot of art. Um, you know, I ended up with a lot of um, drawings of of different things that I um, was trying to play around with, but also learn about. Um, and then, is it, could it be some kind of presentation? Um, presentations are good for um, online courses. You can use a tool like we're using now. Um, on collaborate and students can present to each other. They can present with each other. Um, so maybe this is this whole experience is a group project where they're each taking samplings from local ponds, but they're actually in a very different um, geographical location. And so then they're going to bring their results at, together and compare the results. Um, I changed this heading at the top. It, it said, how will you? measure their success and when. And then I realized that in these authentic experiences, you are not the only one that will be assessing their work or measuring the success of their work. So I kind of switched it around a little bit um, because there's so many different things that um, really people that can um, assess this project. So the first one is you assessing them. 
What kind of assessments do you have? Um, how will you use those rubrics to grade their work and um, be able to measure that they achieved those learning objectives that we started with at the beginning? Um, you can also use Blackboard portfolios. So the students can keep these artifacts, these pieces of work in their portfolio in order to kind of uh, um, longitudinally see their growth and their progression um, and be able to share them with other people, maybe um, somebody in the NIU community or even with um, future employers um, to be able to show some of those skills and experiences that they already have. So important, right, to this uh, 21st century learner that not only do they have real world experiences, but they are able to share them and use them again in their career. Um, and one of the great ways to show employers that they do know, um, they do know what they're talking about and they can prove it because they actually have these article artifacts that show their skills, that show their experiences, um, and that development over time. Um, this next one's kind of interesting, uh, real world evaluation. Uh, one of the real advantages of an authentic learning experience is they may be evaluated um, by other people. And that could be experts, whether it's that researcher or that curator that they met um, in the field. Or if they're doing a community development project, they might um, actually have a supervisor and they can ask their supervisor um, to do an evaluation of their work. Um, they also might do a self-assessment, uh, again, that reflective piece. Um, what did they learn? Um, what do they still want to learn? Um, and then you can also use a peer assessment uh, where students are um, giving each other feedback or, or at least sharing their um, unique experiences and learning from each other. Um, community is very important um, in this idea of authentic learning experiences. Um, well, I told you earlier that I was going to share some exemplars with you um, of what I think some great authentic learning experiences will be. And I was fortunate enough this summer um, to uh, have some conversations with some faculty here at NIU. And when we were just having a conversation and they were describing um, something that they were either thinking about or they've done in their face-to-face -face class and now they want to bring it online, I was like, oh, that is a great authentic experience. Can I please use it in my workshop that's coming up at the end of July? And they were gracious enough to let me um, kind of share some of the things that they have done. So the first one um, is what I would consider a skill building authentic experience. And it's from a Marx called Sales Technology Application. So application, you can, you can feel that verb right in there. Um, it was created by Rob Peterson. And it's kind of a role playing. Um, and so the learning objective is that students will be able to plan and execute a professional sales call. And so this authentic experience is they will actually need to uh, do a sales call. Um, from my understanding, um, they it, it's not a real sales call. They don't really have the... Um, convince somebody of something. Um, he's chosen a lot of experts um, that he knows, and, and they kind of create this um, mock sales call. Um, but in order to do this, because it does say using technology, um, they need to know how to create accounts using the salesforce.com. Um, and then they really need to show that they can be a professional um, during this sales call. Very authentic. Um, not necessarily getting you outside like some of the um, previous examples I've used. You know, you're using technology, you can use your cell phone to um, do this. Um, but certainly authentic, certainly valuable to them in their career as they move on. Um, he's built um, a, a series of readings, so that's kind of information that they're going to know. Um, he does lectures, he actually calls them story time. Uh, Rob is a, a very much 
of a person that likes to tell stories. He likes to share his professional experience with the students. Um, at the very bottom, I put in his faculty role. Um, he describes um, his experience as stories and scars from the revenue generating trenches. And so that's really how he lends his voice to it. Um, and it's something that the students really find valuable. Um, they participate in course discussions. Uh, they definitely talk in preparing the students for that, what it means to have a, a quality um, discussion, but also using quality data um, in preparing for those sales calls. Um, he does has to do a reflection on what they think customers want uh, in preparation for the sales call. And then uh, that how he allows them to share that and what he assesses at the end is actually um, a presentation that happens in week six. So it's not even really a culminating event. Um, this is something that's um, just going to prepare them more and more for, for using some of this sales um, technology that's out there. So again, just add questions if you'd like to the text chat area. Um, if any of you know Rob, he would be happy to have a conversation with you um, about how this goes. Um, he has not done it online yet. So I have confidence that this is a good experience. Um, but, you know, it's, we still don't know what the results are going to be. So um, it's, it'll be interesting to see how it unfolds. Um, my second one is a field trip experience. And in this case, um, it's more about observing the real world as opposed to participating in the real world. Um, in this case, um, Jennifer Gray has um, constructed this authentic experience where the students are going to be visiting a long-term care facility. And um, so she, they are going to be observing. They are not going to necessarily be volunteering or working in a long-term care facility. Um, but this is a culminating experience. So the experience itself is um, presented to the students in different phases. They have different sort of um, mini activities that lead up to the paper and the presentation that's the end. But it addresses um, a variety of her learning objectives, anything from identifying the components of a nursing facility um, all the way to discussing um, impact of cultural competency in providing these long-term care services. So this is really important stuff. And it's, it's something that she finds very valuable that the students need to sort of observe it happening in the real world. Um, she provides her with readings and lectures, again, providing them with some of the things that they're going to need to know going in. Um, a lot of um, participation, again, in those smaller chunks. Um, even I think one of her first activity is um, this uh, field trip review assignment. So, uh, you know, kind of planning for the experience and, and then discussing it with your um, classmates um, before you kind of go out there, um, get some insight from them. Um, and then again, the final the way they're going to share is um, through a paper and a presentation. Jennifer, I would say, is the facilitator. Um, she she knows other faculty that have taught this course too, by the way, it's not just her. And they tend to line up the experiences um, for the students. And so they already have a relationship with a long-term care facility. They may not be able to do that as they grow and the students start um, spreading out a little bit more. But I think they can kind of, uh, she can help with what those long-term facilities might look like and where they can um, go to find uh, a facility to observe. And then a lot of scaffolding uh, because this is a culminating experience that needs to be kind of chunked up and built upon. Um, so I consider Jennifer sort of that facilitator person. My final um, 
exemplar is what I call a um, gaining perspective experience. And this is from the course called American Electoral Democracy. Um, it is taught by Matt Streb. And um, he has done this already for um, some honor students, but he's never done this as a requirement for all of his students. And that's to volunteer to be an electoral judge. And um, he's still working out the kinks. One of the things is um, he may not be able to require it, so he's going to have to come up with kind of an equivalent um, activity for the students. Um, just because if he has um, like an international student or something, they wouldn't be able to volunteer to be an electoral judge. Um, but he, what he wants them to um, do is to be able to debate the rules of elections and how to relate them to electoral democracy. Um, some of his sort of um, module level objectives include identifying the potential barriers to voting. This one at the end is so important to me, though. Um, let me kind of point to it. Um, describe the role of an electoral judge. Again, you can read about it. Um, Matt can lecture about it. He is a great lecturer. He's one of the, the types that just uh, you know wraps you up into his discussion. And um, but it's never going to be as easy to describe as when you are actually an electoral judge yourself. You gain that perspective. And that's why I love this example so much. Um, some of the things he's done to prepare his students for this experience and to kind of define it, like I've been talking about, is he has um, readings and lectures. One of them he calls, should we, um, should we lessen, that's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that typo. Lesson the barriers to voting. And so he has a lecture that he talks about that very specific item. And then he's going to see some of those barriers unfold. Um, they're going to see them as their electoral judges. Um, he definitely wants some kind of reflection, um, whether it be a journal or um, sharing something with the whole class. And then he has these reaction papers and term papers. Um, that The reaction papers actually happen several times during the semester, reacting to different um, topics that he brings up. But then he has a term paper, which is to propose electoral reform um, that the government should enact. And so again, some really powerful stuff that I think these students are never going to forget um, after they experience this. Um, Matt is what I consider the challenger. He's going to encourage his students to grapple with some of these things that are very hard to um, explain in a textbook um, because um, it, they don't often take this. Um, this is a complicated problem. And um, students are going to really, um, they could really be uncomfortable in some situations. And this is going to really help them learn, I think. So I consider Matt the challenger. So those are my three examples. Um, they were very specific to their courses, to their disciplines. Uh, but hopefully, I've given you enough sort of examples um, throughout this that you're going to find some nuggets um, and some places to go with your own courses and creating some more authentic experiences. Um, so here's why it's important. Uh, and this I actually found from EDUCAUSE. And uh, they have an article on authentic learning for the 21st century. The first one is that when learners go through authentic learning, they look for connections. And they don't even look for connections during that experience. But they continue to look for connections um, in, in their future and in, even in different classes and things like that. So, um, authentic learning really encourages relevance. You could, you don't even have to explain the relevance almost because they're going. That relevance is just going to be so clear with these authentic learning experiences. Um, the learners are interested in it at a personal level, and so you know they're putting themselves out there, and and so this will make it easier for them to adopt to the adapt to the next iteration the next context that they need to have a 
a similar experience with or use a similar skill with. Um, my example of sampling um, pond water. Well, when they do go on to sample anything, but even if they were sampling um, briny water or um, you know larger bodies of water or anything like that, they're they're already going to have that really relevant experience that it will be easier for them to kind of um, a, a adapt it again to that new context. Um, authentic learning experiences uh, give them this attachment with practice. And this is one of those ones with, um, that's really important to skill building. Um, if there's something that they practice that they have to do multiple times, it's going to stick into their brain a little bit more. We call these um, schemas. And so that's how students take kind of separate information and they gather them together and their brain puts them into a schema. If you're repeating something over and over again, you that's when you might have learned it and it's not going to take as much brain power to um, you know have to just pull it out at some later point because they're they're going to be practiced at it and then finally um, they're going to start to feel like they need to know more uh, that comes out in their reflections often that um, they're not only part of a bigger world which is what it says here but they want to know more about this bigger world. It's not isolated to the classroom or to their online experience. Um, they now need to know the next thing. That really gets back to what I started talking about with my experience over 10 years ago when I learned about this amazing region in France and um, just continued to want to learn more about it. And you know, again, that was the, the place that I wanted to go back and visit and um, finally see everything for myself. Um, because it really sticks with you. Um, so um, I'm opening things up to any questions that anyone has at this point. Um, but again, I'm just going to stick up my uh, contact information here. I'd love to have more discussions on this. Um, it's one of my academic interests and my passions. Um, but here's a variety of ways that you can get in touch with me. Um, my email, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, you can find out more information about um, online programs here at NIU um, by looking things up or following um, the Online Program Development Support Office. Um, so I'm going to leave that up, and I'm going to be quiet for a while and wait for questions to come in. Every, oh, I see one. It's always, oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say that it seems pretty quiet out there. So I want to make sure that I thank everyone um, for joining me this afternoon. Um, I said at the beginning, usually the summer becomes um, kind of some fun topics. This is a p topic I'm passionate about, but it's, it's kind of heavy too. <laughs> so I appreciate your time and your attention. And thank you, everyone. Have a great, great rest of your summer if you have a chance to enjoy it. Thanks, everyone. And Jennifer, no apologies necessary. I wish your, your connection was better. Thanks for being persistent. <laughs>